Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us, even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved in the name of Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. <laughs>
the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
No, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> if that's what you ask for, <laughs> no, or share. I <laughs> Don't give me the brush back. <laughs> Oh my 
goodness, now we are at that point. And as I have been trying to do for a number of years in my ministry, I'm going to let the two of you baptize me. I'll say the words, and you're going to put the water out. So you need to come up here and get your hands wet. Bring them over the pond. Let's see if this wakes them up. Oh my God, my Such a good boy. You're fine, go right ahead. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Each of you dip a hand in the water. There we go. We baptize you in the name of the Father, but it's not his head. Another one. And of the Son. And of the Holy Spirit. This is yours to keep with him. But right now you need to dry them off. Elon, you belong to Christ in whom you have been baptized. Hallelujah. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit you give your sons and daughters new birth. Cleanse us all from sin and raise us to eternal life. Sustain your life with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Be long, child of God, be sealed by the sign of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, would you bring me a lighted candle, please, Sharon? Oh, you've got it already. <laughs> Here, I'm going to send you up to do this.
also the name of Catherine Kim, which really talks about God's work our hands, which is really a part of our lives as baptized children of Christ. Well, hello, Nancy. How are you, my dear? You're not sure today. No. That's okay. I have a lot of those days. The first reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 35. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, Be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become cool, and the thirsty ground, the ground springs of water. The second reading is from James chapter 2. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there, or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the, law, the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law that fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you if a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food? And one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs? What is the good of that? So faith by itself if it has no works, is it dead? Oh, 
the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Jesus said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by the way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought him, they brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hands on him. He took them aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be open. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The Holy Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now, you should know this too, but the words are all brand new. So, I'll play the hymn through once to make sure you're at least somewhat familiar with.
morning. Good, morning. Good to be here with you this morning. What a blessing for us to share in Elan's baptism this morning, Vanessa. Thank you so much for guiding him to the flock today. Oliver's a little busy today, huh? <laughs> Well, you know what, wouldn't it be wonderful, wonderful if we had 20 children in this age range in the church whose parents were coming to bring them or grandparents coming to bring them regularly to worship. There would be a lot of holy noise going on all during the worship services. So please keep in mind that this, this is a part of God's uh, holy presence in our midst, even though sometimes it's difficult for the ones who are responsible for the children. God has great joy over just the fact that they're here, not that their behavior is perfect. Um, because if perfection were the only thing that would please God, well, our perfection will never please God and it will always be in Jesus Christ. So bring them on in, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, little ones. God loves them all. And there is certainly enough proof in Scripture for Christ's uh, feeling about children as well. In seminary, I'm going to count back. Oh my goodness. Um, probably 41 or 42 years ago. My New Testament professor said, I want you to write a major paper on how James can say faith without works is dead when we accept what Paul says that we are justified by God's grace through faith. And there's not a single mention about works. Well, there's good reason for that. First of all, we have to remember some things that Jesus said in Scripture. When the young man came to talk to Jesus to say, what do I have to do to guarantee that I will make it into heaven. Now this was a wealthy young man. And Jesus said, well, you have to love God with everything you are and your neighbor as yourself, and then go get rid of everything you have and come and follow me. Christ was saddened by the fact that the young, young man walked away. He could not let go of those things that had become the most important God, small g, in his life. So we kind of get an idea about what James has to say. There are some things that you and I must participate in if we are truly accepting and honoring the power of God's love for our lives through holy baptism in the sacrament of the altar if we are going to truly love God for all that God has done for us, we must be doing something. In the ELCA, there's a day, and it's right around today, called God's Work Our Hands. It's meant to bring people from congregations into communities to help out. Now, I can tell you, I, for Chris and Mark, who were two homeless men that we've helped over the last few weeks, it made a real difference in their lives, maybe even the greatest difference in their lives, to identify them and ask their names. Because nobody wants to know their names normally. And then to say, we are going to be praying for you. And I've been trying to remember every single day to offer prayers to God for both Chris and Mark. It's something that we kind of let go of. Remember what Jesus said about, you know, you want to let the wealthy sit with you and around you and be with you, but you don't necessarily want those who are in a much more difficult situation in their lives to be around you. It's easy to get caught up in that dynamic in the church. Everybody should look like you. I grew up in one of those churches. Everybody was blonde-haired and blue-eyed. 
My forebears were the founders of the church, and they were from Sweden. So what would you expect? Today, the church and this church had as a forerunner of it the Augustana Synod and the United Lutheran Church and the Lutheran Church in America and the American Lutheran Church, not this congregation, but a national church body, who all came together to say, we need to be together in all of our differences. In, in my hometown, there was a Danish church, a Swedish church. Now, I'm talking about the only church, the Lutherans. Um, okay, you can smile. That's not true. You know it. And there, there was um, a German Lutheran church. And then there was the little, I haven't quite figured out, the little one on the corner of Danaher and South what would it be that went down to Gunberg's Melody, the street south of Washington Avenue? I never did know what that denomination was. Well, it was Lutheran, but I didn't know what kind of Lutheran. So we all grew up in our own little enclaves, staying together and doing the things with which the people were most familiar and, and which guided their children to learn about those things. I mean, I am so thankful to God that the 5 a.m. Eulita service on Christmas morning left. It went away. It had been done for years and years and years in the parish. And it was something that was really tough for families. If you went to the midnight service and you were up at church at 5 a.m. on Christmas morning, that meant you probably got less than four hours of sleep. So I'm glad those things change. But today, our congregations are very different. Our congregations are a most wonderful blend of people from all over. People like Alice and her family from Africa. People who have come from Mexico. People who grew up in the upper Midwest and now have found themselves in very blended congregations. Now we have James, who is African-American, and Jesse, who is Native American, who are part of our congregation today. And we don't look at them any differently because they are that identity in their lives. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And everyone who accepts Christ as their Lord and Savior is always welcome to become a part of the church or to come and learn about what it means to be a part of the church. So James says, faith without, faith without works is dead. What, what difference would it have made in Mark and Chris's life if we had not stopped, given them a gift, and talked to them, asked them their names, and prayed for them after we departed? Their life would have gone on as normal. For them, it was important for somebody to identify that they're, these folks on street corners are real people. They had moms and dads and sisters and brothers who, when they were the size of Oliver or Elan, had great hopes for their children. And sometimes by personal choice, sometimes by no choice, people end up on street corners asking for assistance and help. So what do we do? What do you and I do over these circumstances and situations? Well, we do a really good job of thinking, if pastor comes at Christmas and says, we're gonna buy chips this year for Christmas and ship them off, we're gonna ship them off to in all likelihood Christian communities either in Central America, South America, Africa, or Southeast Asia. That's good because those people know what we know. Now that's a kind of word, righteousness. But without God and without Christ's presence in it, it isn't enough for us to be assured that the promises we've received in the, at the font and from the altar are really going to be ours. We have to live lives of thanksgiving. And that means taking that thanksgiving into the world. 
It means standing into the pond, getting sprinkled with water on Sunday, and letting that make a difference in who you are out in the community. I wrote a rather lengthy paper and came to the conclusion that if you believe in Christ but you do not respond to the abundant love of God through Jesus Christ by how you live, and by the way, we aren't always going to get it right. That's why Jesus came. But we are meant to try. We are meant to seek ways that make a difference in the lives of people who may need to know our care and our help in order to have a better and a more full life. To know that there are people who still care about them. Care how they're doing. We talk about blessing bags. Man, blessing bags go out of here. The minute they're made, they're gone, and then they're gone from the people who take them because they've given them out to people that they've met. But it's not just handing that bag to somebody. It's handing that bag to them and saying, will you please share your name with me so I can pray for you? I think James was correct. Faith without works is dead. However, Paul was also correct that we are justified by God's grace through God's gift of faith. And we are to be involved in doing the acts of thanksgiving to God, which may or may not be perfect, and when they're not perfect, where do you and I come? We come to church. We come to have our baptismal vows renewed, to have the power of God's grace in Jesus Christ brought into our lives again in the bread and wine of Holy Communion. Because we know we're going to always fall short. Even when we know what is right, we still sometimes can't do it because of the brokenness that is a part of who we all are. So they kind of mesh together. Faith without works is dead and we're justified by grace through faith. Because you and I need to be involved. And as I said last week in my sermon, prayer is a huge event in the lives of people. Don't think just because I'm not giving somebody a gift at a corner that I can't do anything for them. If I don't have the resources to do it, or I'm worried about opening my car window to a stranger I don't know. We still can offer prayers. We still can get that window down far enough to say, what's your name? Will you share it with me, please, so I can pray for you? And then who knows, maybe I'll run into Chris again down on the corner of Kino and Marketplace Drive. I've seen him there numerous times with his cat. I now know who he is. Or maybe we will see on the corner of Albernon and Speedway, between the McDonald's and the Varsity Resort, Mark, who we spoke to at that corner. Because he's bound to be out there. Take the risk. It's what God calls us to. To care for other people in our lives. And we do a really good job in our prayers here at church of caring for folks who are in really bad circumstances right now in their lives. People battling terminal cancer. When I and I don't say this proudly or lightly because I drove for 60 years without a moving violation. When I rear-ended the car in front of me, going pretty darn slow, but it was my fault, I was a little too close, thought they were gonna go through, the yellow hadn't come on, and it just came on as they 
started to move the me. Took their brakes harder than I thought. I'm so thankful to God that the young woman who was driving her one-year-old Kia was not raging and angry with me over the accident. In fact, she was very polite. We exchanged telephone pictures of driver's licenses and insurance, and insurance cards. And I told her that I hoped she was OK. And I said, and everybody in my car was fine. There were no airbags that went off any place. It really was a low-speed collision. But even in that circumstance, sometimes, our grandson got hit downtown and the guy ran, took the car, took the guy in his car and left. That's not living as a Christian in the world. When we're responsible for something, we need to take responsibility for it. So the gospel, it's interesting because James in its beginning answers the question of the young man who goes to Jesus and said, what must I do to attain heaven? And James gives us this laundry list in our reading for today of the things we should not be doing. But if we look at that list, we realize sometimes we're doing those things. Sometimes it's easier for us to welcome somebody who is like us than somebody who is extremely different than us. And what we've discovered here over the years of welcoming GLBTQ people into the congregation and having people who are not fair-skinned and blue-eyed or green-eyed be a part of the congregation is that there is really and truly a wholeness of God's children when we are together. That's important for us to be able to do. My parents were not all certain about the fact that we had adopted two children of color until they came, stayed with us, and met the children. Because my parents grew up where I grew up, an all white community. They had no experience. They, they, they couldn't say of their life experience that they understood that the little boys running around my house who had dark skin were just like their own kids running around their house. There was no difference at all. And until you and I have a willingness to really welcome everyone into our lives and into the love of Jesus Christ, we're really not going to understand the fullness of having all those people be a part of our lives in the church. America is really blessed, folks, to have such diversity as a small congregation. It is really an important part of Christ's presence in our midst. And it says a great deal about who we are as the people of God and the children of Christ in the world. So we need to rejoice. Look at what we did today. We had little Elan, and, and I noticed that Auntie is not giving him up. Um, Belinda's back there with him, hanging on, and saying, your name is Yo-Yo. Your name is Yo-Yo. So may God bless Alice and her family on this wonderful event. And by the way, giving thanks for Alice's twin grandchildren, who are still in the NICU, after what now, three weeks, uh, four weeks, and they're gonna be there a while longer. They were born very prematurely. And Alice cannot wait to get her hands on them. So uh, that, that house down at the end of the parking lot is gonna have lots of little guys running around uh, in, in the very near future. So we give thanks not only for our seniors and our seniors' stability, I, and okay, seniors, you can argue with me about whether you're stable or not. But for the blessing of, of God's gift of life, forgiveness, and salvation that belongs to everyone who is sitting in here, who has come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, 
Amen. Now, I'm going to remind Debbie because usually I'm the one who forgets this. We have already done the Apostles' Creed. I'll skip it. I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> so we will not repeat it after the prayers or after wherever it shows up, before the prayers. So we're going to move right into the prayers of the church. Gracious Lord, we offer a special prayer today for Elaine, Elon's dad. He has an interview tomorrow to get his visa to come here to the United States. So let's remember uh, Elaine and uh, is it Al Alan? Is that how it's pronounced? Alan? In our prayers that everything works out the way that he and Vanessa both hope it will. Gracious Lord, we offer this prayer of support and encouragement for Vanessa and Alan. Keep them in your care. We have no way of understanding how a visa will uh, be given or whether there is a solid hope for that to happen. Uh, but we pray that you will let your hand be in that circumstance so that Alan can arrive here uh, to be with Vanessa and Elon. Hear us, God. Mercy is great. Gracious Lord, we pray for our daughter Rachel, who has got a cold. She's tested, and it's not COVID, it's just an upper respiratory thing. We pray that you'll heal her quickly so, and help her to get rest so she can get back to work. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy is great. Gracious Lord, we pray for Steve, who will be having surgery. Uh, probably this coming week for his cancer. We pray that it will be successful and work out well for him. We pray for Dottie, too, who's going to have surgery. And most of all, we pray that you'll bring your peace and comfort to her body as all of this continues to unfold in her, her life. She is in her 90s and getting joint replacements and work done on uh, bones is not an easy thing to happen when you're younger. We pray you'll be with her to hold her in your care as all of this unfolds. And we pray for uh, Annette as well. They found some masses on her, her liver uh, when they did a CAT scan, and they're going to be looking at that uh, more fully in the coming days. We pray that they are not a serious circumstance for Annette. And if they are, we pray that you'll hold her up with your care and give her your healing. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy is great. Gracious Lord, we pray for the Moore family who lost their 102-year-old mother this week. We pray frequently for those folks who we have loved and their families when death has become a circumstance that's present, present in a family's life. Help us always to remember that the grave is nothing more than a gate. It is a stage through which we all must pass as we attain your promise of eternal life. We live with that hope in our lives every single day. And we ask now that uh, as the Moore family uh, grieves, that you'll be with them to bring them a sense of hope and comfort in this difficult time in the family. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy is great. 
All these things we pray for in the name of your Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Please greet one another with the peace of the Lord. Prepare our hearts and minds to receive the sacrament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This sacrament is for all who accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. It comes to us because of the grace of Christ's Father and the power of Christ's love for God's children. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray the prayer of our response. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please come and receive the sacrament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace, now and forever. Amen.